So we are analyzing a masterful historic speech that recently happened on the floor of the U.S. Senate. The person giving the speech is Raphael Warnock. He was recently elected as a Georgia senator, and he's also a pastor. And so he's giving his first speech on the Senate floor, which happens to be a masterpiece of modern oratory. So we get the pleasure of listening to his incredible oratory. And at the same time, we're going to analyze some of the things that he does with his voice to hold and direct his listeners' attention. We'll listen for intonation, what he chooses to emphasize, what he chooses to de-emphasize, and some other elements of speech music as well, like rhythm and pacing. Are you ready for some good news? I took some of the most irresistible rhythms and impactful phrases from this powerful speech and made you a practice sheet with audio so you can practice them and get them into your system. It's completely free and you can find it in the description. So here's where we are in the speech. Reverend Warnock just got through describing who the two senators were when he was born. At the time that Reverend Warnock was born, the two senators from the Southern state of Georgia were arch segregationists. This means that they wanted to preserve the way of life that had been going on in the South of the United States from just a little bit after the end of slavery until about the mid 1960s. This was a period after the South lost the Civil War and they had to free Black people, they were no longer able to keep them as slaves, they quickly found a way to keep Black people oppressed. It was a system of laws and also a way of life known as Jim Crow. So Jim Crow had many ways of keeping Black people oppressed. And one of those ways Part of that system was having separate facilities for Black people and white people so they couldn't go to the same school, they couldn't eat in the same place, etc. But there was a struggle for civil rights that began happening in the mid-1900s and sort of culminated in the 1960s where Jim Crow was challenged and many laws were overturned and against their will, a lot of people in the South had to integrate. So when the Supreme Court ruled that segregation was no longer going to be legal in the United States, the Georgia Senator Talmadge warned that blood would run in the streets of Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia. So this was the Senator when Raphael Warnock was born. Well, now Raphael Warnock has been elected senator himself. Now let's hear what Reverend Warnock has to add to this little story. And led by a preacher and a patriot named King, Americans of all races stood up. History vindicated the movement that sought to bring us closer to our ideals. History vindicated the movement that sought to bring us closer to our ideals. History vindicated the movement. This is the civil rights movement. Vindicated, that means proved that it was right. This is somewhat formal, and he goes through it kind of quickly. History vindicated the movement that sought to bring us closer. Sought is the past of seek. To seek to do something is to try to do something. So I seek to do it. I try to do it. I sought to do it. I tried to do it but it's a little bit more formal. So history vindicated the movement. History proved that the movement was right, that sought to bring us closer, that tried to bring us closer to our ideals. These ideals, these Jeffersonian ideals of personal freedom for everyone, because there's a big contradiction at the heart of this country when it was founded. It was founded on the ideal of freedom, while at the same time enslaving a whole race of people. So there was a big contradiction from the beginning. We have these ideals, 
but we have a contradiction. So there's this like contradiction in the soul of America, you could say, and we're working toward these ideals. And this movement, the civil rights movement, was trying to bring us closer to these ideals. History vindicated the movement that sought to bring us closer to our ideals, to lengthen and strengthen the cords of our democracy. To lengthen and strengthen the cords of our democracy. This is a regional pronunciation. I would say lengthen and strengthen, but he says lengthen and strengthen the cords of our democracy. Okay. And I now hold the seat, the Senate seat, where Herman E. Talmadge sat. And I now hold the seat, the Senate seat, where Herman E. Talmadge sat. Wow. So this is really impactful. So he went really quickly through all of that to be able to change pace and go slowly on this really impactful statement. I now hold the seat the Senate seat where Herman E. Talmadge sat. So that senator that said blood would run in the streets because segregation was being ended, well, his Senate seat is now held by a Black man, the first Black person to be elected to the Senate from the old Confederate state of Georgia. So this is really historic. This is really powerful. And people didn't think that it would happen yet. They thought Georgia wasn't ready, but Georgia proved them wrong because of some real organizing, getting people registered to vote, getting people out to vote that allowed this to happen. And here I want you to listen for something special. It's the seat, the Senate seat. And I now hold the seat, the Senate seat. We stress seat the first time we mention it, but not the second time. Once it's old, repeated information, we don't stress it anymore. We stress something different, the Senate seat. And this is a pattern that happens over and over in spoken English that you might not have noticed before, but I will keep pointing it out to you so you can start to notice it and use it yourself. This is a lot like, my name is Bond, James Bond. It's Bond, right? James Bond. The second time you say Bond, you de-emphasize it because now it's old information. It's already been mentioned. And I now hold the seat, the Senate seat, where Herman E. Talmadge sat. And that's why I love America. <laughs> and that's why I love America. And then people laugh. I love America because we always have a path to make it better. Notice his pronunciation of better. He doesn't say better with an R on the end. So this is another regional pronunciation he has. Better, better. We always have a path to make it better. And I think this is a pretty good reason to say you love America. Some people say they love America and that America is the greatest country ever as if, as if we don't have any room for improvement, right? A lot of people think it's very patriotic to say how great we are and that's all they say. But he's saying not that he loves America because America is already perfect. He's saying we always have a path to make it better. And that's more realistic to me. <laughs> So I like that reason for loving America better than some of the ones that I hear. We always have a path to make it better, to build a more perfect union. A more perfect union. This is a phrase from the constitution that he is alluding to that everybody recognizes, even if they don't know where it's from, they know they've heard, okay, more perfect union, in order to form a more perfect union, a more perfect union. He's referencing our founding ideals. Now we're gonna skip ahead a little bit in the speech, but I'll tell you that he starts talking about voter suppression tactics that are being rolled out across the country right now by Republican legislatures at the state level 
trying to limit people's ability to vote. And the reason this is happening, he doesn't say so in his speech, but I can just fill you in that the reason this is happening is because Republicans represent a smaller and smaller part of the country. And they know that the only way they can stay in power is by limiting people's ability to vote. So instead of changing their values, changing their policies to appeal to more people, they want to stick to these values that only represent a minority of the people, but stay in power by keeping the majority of the people from voting. So when Joe Biden got elected, they didn't like that. And when two Democratic senators were elected in Georgia, which was not expected in Georgia, they didn't like that. And so across the country, they are rolling out, wherever there are Republican state legislatures, they're rolling out laws to make it harder for people to vote. So he's condemning this, and he's is using his first speech on the Senate floor to tell his fellow senators that we need to pass this act that he's trying to pass. It's a law that he's pushing to get passed to make it easier for people to vote. But then what happened? That is what happened after the unexpected election results in Georgia this winter. Some politicians did not approve of the choice made by the majority of voters in a hard fought election in which each side got the chance to make its case to the voters. And rather than adjusting their agenda, rather than changing their message, they are busy trying to change the rules. Did you hear that contrast intonation? Rather than changing their message, they're busy trying to change the rules. Contrast the rules. Not the message, but the rules. Rather than changing their message, they are busy trying to change the rules. We are witnessing right now a massive and unabashed assault on voting rights unlike anything we've ever seen since the Jim Crow era. This is Jim Crow in new clothes. This is Jim Crow in new clothes. And then he stumbles. This extremely eloquent speaker stumbles but then he just keeps going because it is okay to mess up. We all still love you, you just keep going. Now Reverend Warnock goes on to call out and denounce voter suppression tactics, and he does it with a rhythm that is completely irresistible. And as a voting rights activist, I've seen up close just how draconian these measures can be. I hail from a state that purged 200,000 voters from the roll one Saturday night in the middle of the night. We know what's happening here. Some people don't want some people to vote. Do you hear how he's using his rhythm to make his point? Da 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 da. Some people don't want some people to vote. I've seen up close. I've long short short. I've seen up close just how draconian these measures can be. Seen up close just how draconian these measures can be. I hail from a state. I hail from a state. That means I am from a state. I hail from a state that purged 200,000 voters from the roll. One Saturday night in the middle of the night. One Saturday night in the middle of the night. We know what's happening here. Some people don't want some people to vote. Are you hearing this rhythm? He is a master. Some people don't want some people to vote. One Saturday night, in the middle of the night. I hail from a state that purged 200,000 voters from the roll one Saturday night, in the middle of the night. We know what's happening here. Some people don't want some people to vote. We know what's happening here. Some people don't want some people to vote. What can I say? 
It's addictive. So I want to know what you think. Do you find these rhythms as irresistible as I do? And do you like diving deep into the speech music of spoken English? Let me know. Now Reverend Warnock's going to bring up a big name in civil rights. Listen to how he pauses for effect before he pronounces the name. I was honored on a few occasions to stand with our hero and my parishioner, John Lewis. I was honored on a few occasions to stand with our hero and my parishioner, pause, John Lewis. Yeah. He was a civil rights icon who put his body on the line and got beaten badly fighting for civil rights and only last year died. And so everyone recognizes him for the civil rights icon that he is. John Lewis was a member of Senator Warnock's church. And his name is so powerful and his, his loss is pretty fresh. And so he pauses before his name and then just says it down low because his name on its own and his memory on its own is impactful enough. The way he stresses it is by just letting it be low. John Lewis. I was his pastor, but I'm clear he was my mentor. I was his pastor, but uh, I'm clear he was my mentor. So this is contrast. I was his pastor, but he was my mentor. So I was his ex, but he was my Y. We have to, we have to stress that my, because we're contrasting the possessive in this case. Usually you wouldn't say he was my mentor. You would say he was my mentor, right? He was my mentor. But here I was his pastor, but he was my mentor. I was his pastor, but I'm clear he was my mentor. On more than one occasion, we boarded buses together after Sunday church services as part of our Souls to the Poles program, encouraging the Ebenezer Church family and communities of faith to participate in the democratic process. Now, just a few months after Congressman Lewis's death, there are those in the Georgia legislature, some who even dared to praise his name, that are now trying to get rid of Sunday souls to the polls, making it a crime for people who pray together to get on a bus together in order to vote together. Wow. He is chastising people who are opposing this righteous activity that he and this icon of civil rights that we just recently lost, John Lewis, participated in. Souls to the polls. And watch your O, oh, souls. See the W on the end? Souls to the polls, O oh, to the O, oh, souls to the polls. So this was where, after Sunday church, the church members could get on the bus, drive together to the polls, and vote. Well, now... Some people are trying to make it illegal to do souls to the polls and listen to how he chastises them. This really does sound like a preacher. Do you hear what he's doing with his voice when he chastises them? Let's listen again. Now, just a few months after Congressman Lewis's death. Now, just a few months after Congressman Lewis's death. That's a very interesting intonation. Death. Now, just a few months after Congressman Lewis's death, there are those in the Georgia legislature. There are those in the Georgia legislature. Those in the Georgia legislature. Again, he changes the intonation of the, the he changes the stress of the word. It's usually legislature, but he makes it fit into his rhythm. There are those in the Georgia legislature. Wow. There are those in the Georgia legislature, some who even dared to praise his name, that are now trying to get rid of Sunday souls to the polls, making it a crime for people who pray together to get on a bus together in order to vote together. Some who even dared to praise his name. Some who even dared to praise his name. So he's pointing out the hypocrisy that they would praise the name of John Lewis, but then try to make it illegal to do the things that he was participating in. And 
that he devoted his entire life to, in fact. Some who even dared to praise his name that are now trying to get rid of Sunday souls to the polls, making it a crime for people who pray together to get on a bus together in order to vote together. Making it a crime for people who pray together to get on a bus together to vote together. Pray, bus, vote. I think that's wrong. Mm, I think that's wrong. Yeah, here's his point. Punch, 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 punch. I think that's wrong. Every word stressed. Short sentence major impact. I think that's wrong. And he's got the moral authority of Martin Luther King Jr. behind him, of John Lewis behind him, of the fact that he's a pastor behind him. Matter of fact, I think that a vote is a kind of prayer. Matter of fact, as a matter of fact becomes shortened and reduced to matter of fact, as a matter of fact is what we usually say. But he wants to get through this quickly and de-emphasize it and make his point. As a matter of fact, matter of fact, I think a vote is a kind of prayer. Again, a kind of the thing we just mentioned. Souls to the polls, making it a crime for people who pray together to get on a bus together in order to vote together. I think that's wrong. Matter of fact, I think that a vote is a kind of prayer. Yes. Matter of fact, I think that a vote is a kind of prayer. Yes, a kind of the thing we just mentioned, because he just mentioned it. He said, making it a crime for people who pray together to get on a bus together to vote together. So the pray part was something that he already mentioned. And just that little fact of having mentioned it in part of his previous sentence is enough for us to de-emphasize it because it's already been mentioned. And now it's like part of the context that we're already discussing. So this is why he says, matter of fact, I think that a vote is a kind of prayer. Yes, a kind of the thing we just mentioned. Because normally you would say a vote is a kind of prayer. This is how it sounds if we're introducing prayer for the first time. A vote is a kind of prayer. A vote is a kind of prayer. But English does something special with old information. We de-emphasize it and then we emphasize the contrasting element. So here, a vote is a kind of prayer. Kind is at the high end of my range, and prayer is about as low as I can comfortably go, and I can't go there comfortably for very long. A vote is a kind of prayer, a kind of the thing I just mentioned. Matter of fact, I think that a vote is a kind of prayer for the kind of world we desire for ourselves and for our children. For the kind of world we desire for ourselves and for our children. But all of that is a little bit low because he already made his main poetic, impactful point. A vote is a kind of prayer. For the kind of world we desire for ourselves and for our children. And our prayers are stronger when we pray together. To be sure, we have seen these kinds of voter suppression tactics before. They are part of a long and shameful history in Georgia and throughout our nation. Okay, going through all of that really fast to get to another place where he slows down, I'm sure. But refusing to be denied. Mm -hmm. Georgia citizens and citizens across our country brave the heat and the cold and the rain, some standing in line for five hours, six hours, ten hours. The heat and the cold and the rain, some standing in line for five hours, six hours, ten hours. Just to exercise their constitutional right to vote, young people, old people. Just to exercise their constitutional right to vote. He's not quite done constitutional right to vote. If he were done, he would say constitutional right to vote. But he says constitutional right to vote. So I know to listen for more. Sick people. Working people. Sick people. Working people. 
people is not usually stressed because we know we're talking about people. We're people. And so we talk about people all the time. It's the context we're usually talking about. So we say sick people, working people. Already underpaid, forced to lose wages. Already underpaid, forced to lose wages. To pay a kind of poll tax. To pay a kind of poll tax. Poll tax was one of the ways that they used to keep Black people from voting. You would have to pay to go vote. And so guess who couldn't afford to pay? Well, poor people. And guess who was usually poor? Black people. So a poll tax was one of the old ways of suppressing the vote. Well, now you can do the same thing, but it's not a poll tax. You make people wait in lines for hours to vote, and so they lose wages from their work. And that's effectively like a poll tax. And how do some politicians respond? And how do some politicians respond? I can hear his voice getting up. He's going to chastise them again. Chastise is, um, it's like a biblical word for scold, but scold from a place of moral authority. He's going to, I can hear him. He's getting ready. Well, they're trying to make it a crime to give people water. They're trying to make it a crime to give people water. Again, he pronounces it with a regional accent where he doesn't pronounce the R. I say water, he says water. And a snack. As they wait in lines that are obviously being made longer by their draconian actions. Think about that. Think about that. Think about that. Yeah. So he's in, in the middle of this eloquent speech, this powerful oratory where he's got great control of language. He takes a moment to just say, as if you would say from one pers to, person to another very conversationally, think about that. Think about that. Think about that. They're the ones making the lines longer. They're the ones making the lines longer. Through these draconian actions. Through these draconian actions. Dr draconian is a word that um, it means severe, harsh, cruel. And a lot of the time it's dr draconian laws or draconian punishments. This is the first time I think I've heard anybody use it with the, with the noun actions, but okay, draconian actions. And then they want to make it a crime to bring grandma some water while she's waiting in a line that they're making longer. What can I say? So he stresses a lot of things in this sentence, right? Then they want to make it a crime to bring grandma some water while she's waiting in a line that they're making longer. Make no mistake. Make no mistake. Make no mistake. That means do not be confused. Make no mistake. But he says it very low. Make no mistake. This is democracy in reverse. Pause. Make them anticipate what's coming next. Short sentence. Say it slowly. Impactful. This is democracy in reverse. Rather than voters being able to pick the politicians, the politicians are trying to cherry pick their voters. Rather than voters being able to pick the politicians, the politicians are trying to cherry pick their voters. Contrast again, rather than the voters pick the politicians, the politicians, now this is one element of contrast, right? Because it should be voters pick politicians, right? You go vote and you pick who you want to be your representative, right? Rather than voters picking the politicians, the politicians, this is contrast because now this is the one that's picking instead of this. The politicians want to cherry pick their voters. So both elements are contrasted. Rather than A picking B, B wants to pick A. And cherry pick is a word that means pick only the things that you want out of a group. If you want to prove that something is good, you can cherry pick the data by picking only the data that supports your opinion. So cherry picking is picking only what you want out of a certain group. So the politicians wanna cherry pick 
they're voters. So they only want to allow votes from people who are going to vote for them. How convenient, right? I say this cannot stand. Again, I say this cannot stand. It's kind of like when he said, I think that's wrong, right? I say this cannot stand. And so I rise, Mr. President. And so I rise, Mr. President. Now, this is how he started his speech, right? I rise today. Instead of I stand here, I rise. And again, he's repeating it. And so I rise, Mr. President, the person you're addressing, they go down. Hi, Don, right? Good morning, James. I rise, Mr. President. Because that sacred and noble idea, one person, one vote, is being threatened right now. Because that sacred and noble idea, one person, one vote, is being threatened right now. Bop, 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 bop. His rhythm, repetitive, right? Short and repetitive. Sacred idea, one person, one vote, threatened right now. Politicians in my home state and all across America in their craven lust for power. Politicians in my home state and all across America in their craven lust for power. Wow, craven lust. Craven is sick, twisted, evil. And lust is like an unclean desire, usually a sexual desire, but it can be applied to other things. And in this case, lust for power. Have launched a full-fledged assault on voting rights. They are focused on winning at any cost, even the cost of the democracy itself. We're going to skip forward a little bit to a really interesting sentence that he says. Let's listen. Reinhold Niebuhr was right. Humanity's capacity for justice makes democracy possible, but humanity's inclination to injustice makes democracy necessary. Mm -hmm. So Reinhold Niebuhr was right. Humanity's capacity for justice makes democracy possible. That's sort of abstract, but okay. But humanity's inclination to injustice makes democracy necessary. But humanity's inclination to injustice, contrast, right? Capacity for justice, inclination to injustice, justice contrasted with injustice. Under normal conditions, we wouldn't say injustice, we would just say injustice. But when we contrast it with the word justice, we just can't help it. We have to stress the contrast. Justice, injustice. So humanity's capacity for justice is contrasted with humanity's inclination to injustice. Interesting, right? Makes democracy necessary. Uh, and there's another contrast. Makes democracy necessary. So humanity's capacity for justice makes democracy possible. But humanity's inclination to injustice makes democracy necessary. He pauses and really slows down on that word, necessary, and says it syllable by syllable. And what a great word, right? necessary. For paying attention to intonation, it's a four-syllable word with stress on the first syllable at the end of a sentence going down and closing out a sentence, right? Makes democracy necessary. John Lewis understood that and was beaten on a bridge defending it. Amelia Boynton like so many women not mentioned nearly enough. Like so many women not mentioned nearly enough, down here like in parentheses. Was gassed on that same bridge. Extending these words for emphasis. A white woman named Viola Luiso was killed. Now, even the worst is being killed, right? White woman named Viola Luisa, first name, last name, Viola Luisa, was killed. Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman, two Jews and an African-American standing up for that sacred idea of democracy also paid the ultimate price. Fast, 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 fast. Get to my point. Also paid the ultimate price. And we in this body. And we in this body. 
this sounds like a question, but he doesn't have a question structure. And we in this body. And we in this body would be stopped and stymied by partisan politics. Would be stopped and stymied? Like, are you serious? Are you kidding me? The only thing that makes this a question is his intonation would be stopped and stymied. It's not a question word order, but it's a question because of his voice. Would be stopped and stymied by partisan politics. Would be stopped and stymied by partisan politics. Are you freaking kidding me? Short term political gain. Short term political gain. Senate procedure. What? Senate procedure? There's something in the Senate rules that could keep them from passing this really important voting rights legislation. He's saying, are we, so these people just, these people, not just, but these people lost their lives. They paid the ultimate price to get people the right to vote. Now, are we in this body going to stop defending and protecting the right to vote because of some silly technical rule in the Senate? Are you freaking kidding me? I say let's get this done no matter what. I urge my colleagues to pass these two bills, strengthen and lengthen the cords of our democracy, secure our credibility as the premier voice for freedom-loving people and democratic movements all over the world. What can I say? He's a powerful speaker. And when the future for all of our children. Mr. President, I yield the floor. That's, that's George's new Democratic senator, the Reverend Raphael Warnock, giving his first speech from the Senate floor in a rare display in the Senate. The people in the room gave him a standing ovation. If you're still here, first of all, thank you for staying with me to the end. And also, you're probably as fascinated by speech music as I am and appreciate real conversations and meaningful content. So if that's you, be sure you're subscribed so that when I create new things, you'll find out about them. And now I owe you a little conversation to clarify a problematic choice of words I made in the first video. I said, I want to help you hear things that are happening in spoken English that I can hear as a native speaker and also an English teacher. Native speaker and English teacher. This conversation deserves a space of its own. So if you're interested in exploring what's problematic about this language, hop over to this video and we'll talk. <laughs> Don't, 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 don't,